I'm Rob Decker, Corporate Vice President for Cedar Fair Entertainment. Excellent. And when do you personally become involved in uh, the planning of an attraction at a Cedar Fair park? Uh, are you actually the one that starts the ball rolling? Yeah, I, I'm working on the, the five-year plan, the capital expenditures for the park. And so I work with the executive management team uh, directly with Matt Wee, Matt, Richard Zimmerman, and uh, the others just to come up for what's next. You know, what, what's going to really drive the gate? What are people going to really enjoy? Yeah, right. Where did the initial inspiration for this ride behind you come from? Well, you know, I've, I've always wanted to put something over the front gate of Cedar Point. You know, it's the world's best amusement park, uh, roller coaster capital of the world. And so I've waited patiently for a number of years. And then uh, with, uh, with IAPA being uh, the big trade show, met with Walter Bollinger, and I'd say within five minutes, this gatekeeper concept was born. So uh, Walter was just describing what, what he's doing next, working on a wing coaster. And uh, just, you know, I, I got a feel for how well it was doing in Gardaland from him. Very little downtime, high reaction. And we just started to think about how we can make it bigger, better in Cedar Point fashion. Excellent. Since Walter isn't here in person, I've heard a little bit about his inspiration for the wing rider type of coaster. Would you mind sharing that? Sure. I mean, I said, so describe it for me, Walter. And he said, look, when, when I'm in an airplane, I'm in the cabin, I really want to be out on the wing. That would just be a lot more fun, don't you think? And I said, yeah, but I mean, that's, you know, it's kind of terrifying at the same time. And uh, the more he talked, the more you think about the dynamic motion, being out away from the track, just being amplified, you know, and uh, if you can control that, which he obviously can, uh, it's just a much more dynamic ride. It's a differentiator from the other rides that we have in the park. What was the criteria for this attraction? Yeah, I think it was, uh, you know, so what do you do after you build a 200 foot coaster in Magnum, 300 foot in Millennium Force, and 400 top wheel dragster? Well, we have Maverick, but it's been six years now, right? Um, so I was really looking for something that is broad, that a lot of people can ride, but still is exhilarating. Didn't have to be bleeding edge, but cutting edge, you know, so something that's going to be reliable. So all of those are just parameters, but when it comes down to what do you really want to do, I just thought as soon as I heard wing coaster and, uh, and actually went to Gurney and rode the one there, I knew we would have a great concept that people could enjoy hit on something I was going to ask about a minute ago, um, and that is, you talked about Magnum, you talked about Millennium Force Drags, or the records. How important are the records to Cedar Point moving forward? Is that kind of like we've been there, we've done that, or speak to that? You know, I, I think in the process I don't really consciously think about it, but you get to the point where you're really close on the precipice of something really great. And then you think about it and you say, look, if I just went another two, three hundred feet, what does that do for the ride experience? Do we get a stronger finish? You know, do we, do we put uh, more track in some section? And so if you're that close to a record, you better grab it. And after all, it's Cedar Point. So the bar's set pretty high already and people expect the best from us. And are there any specific stories about crucial moments in the planning and design process for this ride where it was kind of just that, that eureka moment? Yeah, I think several. You know, so it, going back to how it was conceived, we were at IAPA and I was in a meeting and we were going through our five year plan. And I think we were at break or Matt, you know, strategically stopped the meeting and he met with myself, Richard Zimmerman, and Phil Bender and said, look, we need something really strong for Cedar Point. It's got to be strong. Go back to the trade show floor and come back and let me know what you find. And I took that as a very polite way of saying, you need to get on the ball and get something good here. So I was going to come back with a good report or hit the airport and <laughs> never to be seen again. But um, he's such, a, he's such a, um, you know, a great thought partner. And, um, and he's right, you know, we, we were working, we were looking at a lot of different things, but the cadence for Cedar Point, it was coming up, it was time for another roller coaster. And so we were at the right place at the right time, met with Walter Bollinger, sat in the booth, and within five minutes, Gatekeeper was born. So the neat thing is we come back, you know, here's, here's the concept, here's what it is. And so what's the first question? What do you think he would ask? It wasn't 
what I would expect, which is, well, how much would that cost? You know, his first question was, what would you call it? He's already thinking of the marketing, the imagery, how the people could connect to it, and he's always, he's that next step already. So it's really encouraging, you know, to work with the executive team, get out there as far as we can, and, and make sure it's gonna work for everyone. What does this ride symbolize for Cedar Point? And immediately a couple things come to mind, taking back to the roots. The fact that the beach is one of the reasons this park exists. You're going out to the beach. The fact that you've had a lot of iconic rides all along the midway, and this is the icon to top all icons. Just speak to the symbolism of it, if you don't mind. Yeah, I think you know, placemaking is something that, that I'm very strong on. You need a good sense of place. And so when you come to Cedar Point and you're coming across the causeway, it's the landscape of all the roller coasters. And you can just see everyone in the back seat pointing and going, oh, look, and this and that. And then the beach, a mile long stretch of beach is just beautiful. So you don't really want to wall that in, which over time, you know, the park tended to do that. So we had the opportunity to open up the views of the beach. It started with Windseeker, just a little tease. But then with this and removal of disaster transport, we could open it all the way up. But I think the crowning moment is, you know, to celebrate the arrival to Cedar Point. I've always wanted to put a roller coaster at the front gate. It just says you're the roller coaster capital of the world. And to get the arch flyover, the rotation, and go through the keyhole elements, people screaming as you're coming in, the excitement should just build right off of that so everyone has a great day. When you fix your bike, it actually Mac, can you hit those two lights, please? And my next question is just how high were the stakes for Gatekeeper and uh, what was the risk involved in a capital investment this huge? Well, you know, that's the thing. So you get, you get a, a bundle of ideas together and it's going to snap into place and that's the master planning side of it. So we always check back. I don't want to get paved down a road too far that's not going to lead anywhere. So I'm always checking back with the team. And we're, we're calculating that. We're talking to the marketing team. We're seeing you know, the opportunity for growth. We're trying to reach out further into the marketplace and get outside of just you know, the, the 150 mile radius. And so it's going to take something of stature to get people to pay attention to it. And so that's, that's a big factor. So you know, given the, the history of the park and where we've been with world record breaking roller coasters, this has to be of that caliber, A, it has to be enjoyable for people, and I think topical. And uh, some of the elements here, flying through the keyholes, not just a duck and tuck and you know, the innate fear of am I going to hit, am I not, but it's, it's a great visual as well. Can you talk about any concepts in the brainstorming sessions that were thought of but just didn't, you weren't able to follow through on them, anything that was considered for 2013, but this just kind of topped all those ideas? Yeah, so I think, you know, we're always looking to go uh, taller, faster, or more experiential, or something along those lines. Um, you know, we have some other things in the works. Uh, some could be quite hard to do, given that the park is uh, so well developed at this point. Um, but this was, this was a neat opportunity to take the corner of the park and get out to the lake and get out to the front gate. But I think, you know, one of the obstacles really was the keyhole towers themselves and how those would be built. And when you think about it, uh, B&M gave us a great ride. It was going to be supported by the round columns that you see, the steel columns, and we were going to put the gate around it so the architecture would encapsulate the ride. That's a challenge because you need to inspect the ride. Daily maintenance, it could be cracking, you need to check the bolts, things you need to stay on top of. So in the end, we designed the front gate and gave it to B&M and in a nice way said, could you please develop this so that that supports up the ride? versus what you have and us just enclosing it. So that was about a two month process to work through all the details. A lot of sleepless nights, but it was well worth it. I think it turned out really spectacular. It's fascinating just to hear about the, the brains that have to go into something like this. Just a, one of the detail out of the ride would take that long just to, to get it perfect. And uh, would you say that at Cedar Fair in general, front gate coasters are becoming a trend? Of course, we've seen uh, Silver Bullet, Dominator, Leviathan, now Gatekeeper. Is that, uh, is that something that's going to become a staple of Cedar Fair properties? Well, it's possible. I mean, that's, that's a good point that, you know, the identity of the park 
is you know for its roller coasters. So at Cedar Point, I think this was a natural, and we don't have a lot of intellectual property, uh, heavy theming, etc. So I think back to that placemaking and sense of place. If you can resonate to the market about thrills and develop something at the front, and Leviathan is a good example of that. We had other locations in the park for it, but we chose the one at the front because there's a big overbank turn, and as soon as you enter, you know the ride's going to pass overhead, and it just gets you pumped up for the day. It's why you came. It's why you're there. You can't wait to get on the ride, and it just comes right out to the front door and says, "Come on in. We're having a great time." That's fantastic. And um, you answered some of these already. Thank you so much just for all the detail you're willing to go into. Um, let me ask you about the construction process a little. What were some of the specific challenges, especially with the geographical location, uh, that went into making this ride? Well, the, the construction team here was, was really stellar. Uh, Ohio-based team uh, led by Augie Lococo here in-house. And, you know, you have to build through the winter. We operate in the summer, and so you have to be ready with all of your documents. And come September, October, things are slowing. You know, we had to close a couple rides before we were really closed with the park. Uh, convincing park operations that that's going to happen isn't always easy, but it's worth it in the end for a little bit of sacrifice. What you run into right here on the lake is high wind conditions. So any of the high work with your cranes could be delayed until you're waiting for a better day. Uh, wasn't the worst winter, wasn't the best winter. Uh, so you're just trying to time everything. But fortunately, we were so far ahead of this that if we lost a few days, we knew we could recapture. I never really had a concern about, about that. And then it's just, uh, it's about all the detail. You know, we're, we're trying to be a very detail-oriented company and get to everything. So the last few things are the signage. What is the sound in the queue gonna be like? And you know, all of those things and the lighting. So testing right up to the end, but we're in really great shape. And uh, how, how long was Disaster Transport on the shopping block? Is that one of those rides where you knew for a long period of time this ride's reaching the of its life cycle, we need to replace it? Was that a huge consideration, or was it just convenient to take it out? Look, so every ride has a life cycle, and uh, we do a great job maintaining the rides and uh, keeping them in service. But, you know, guests tend to vote with their feet. And uh, the Space Spiral, for instance, the ridership was, was pretty low on it and the maintenance costs were extremely high. And so we have to just put that through the matrix of, you know, how are we entertaining the guests versus, you know, the cost per guest to entertain them and, uh, and then talk to people and see what they really like. So the, the one thing I'll say about disaster transport is 46 inch height requirement. So I'm keen to get something back in the park. That's that, that type of ride that you can ride and then graduate up to the big boy rides, the 48 inch rides. So I think that's the only part of disaster I'm gonna miss, um, but we're on it. And that was something I was gonna ask about. Is it just sheer happenstance that there were two kind of family rides removed for a high thrill attraction? Does that speak to Cedar Fair's priorities at all? No, I wouldn't say that as much. And what we really tried to get with Gatekeeper Although it's at 52 inches, a broad ride that a lot of people can, can ride. So it's just not to the extremes. It's not uh, so aggressive that you can't ride it again and again. And so I think, you know, when you, when you watch the people come off of the ride, you might be a little intimidated by whatever, the height or the rotation or the number of uh, inversions on it. Uh, I think you can warm up to it. Once you ride it, you'll ride it again and again. So we're trying to get the type of ride that's gonna be attractive to people, but also families can ride together, friends can ride together, you know, they have that connection, they're high-fiving, and it just it makes us feel good about their day. And with the restraints, I noticed they're, they're different than other B&M coasters, other sit-down coasters, like the Raptor, for example. Is that to try to bring the, the height restriction down? Because I noticed they're a lot more uh, constricting than other, than other rides. Is that kind of being able to stop behind that? Well, here, I, I really like the restraints on this because I think it's a very comfortable fit. It just comes down like a vest. And the first thing you do is an inversion and you, you land right into your chest. And some of the rides like that from the past that are flying, uh, I would always have to try to adjust. But this is, is a comfortable fit, but it's snug, so you feel secure. 
and then it has the armature of the metal that comes around it that you can hold on to, but it's also going to make the restraint work for you. So it's a redundant system as you would expect, you know, for safety being so important. Uh, but I like the fact that it's comfortable. If there is side to side movement, you know, there's not a head bonking uh, type of a situation. So I'm, I'm very pleased with the restraint. Would you mind talking about your first experience? You mentioned, uh, just you kind of touched on it. What was it like after all the planning to finally sit down and be holding up that lift hill? Well, I, I think that's got to be the benefit of the job. So I got the call. The B&M were ready to release the ride to the park. We don't ride it until, you know, operationally it's safe. They're comfortable with it. It's doing everything that they would expect and then we get to, to go for a test run. So they take off the water dummies and the real dummies get on, right? So I'm there in the front seat and uh, I think the first ride, my adrenaline was just really, really jacked sky high. So I was just so proud of it, but it was a lot faster than I thought it would be. I feel like I've ridden it a thousand times before. I didn't rush through the elements, but 67 miles an hour is fast. And I just sort of lost that, you know, along the way and uh, and then rediscovered it in my first ride so I was very impressed with it. The second ride was even better for me because I think uh, I, then I could just start to take in the elements a little more, focus on the keyholes and uh, third, fourth, fifth, I just can't wait to ride it again and again. How do you know it's a success? How? Yes. How will you know? Will How it be will we know? Financial? Will it be just gauging reactions coming off the ride? What determines yeah. whether that is? Well, look, uh, we don't get to vote. And so that's, that's what the guests do for us, and they tell us. They tell us whether they like it, whether they don't. Uh, I don't think we um, necessarily have trophies on the shelf. You know, we're not that kind of company. Uh, I just want people to just have a really great time here at Cedar Point, and the expectation's so high. So with every investment, it has to be stellar. It has to be top drawer. So we put $30 million into this just to make sure that we're going to get the ride capacity that we need so everyone gets to ride and it's going to be a great experience that people will talk about and come back again and again. Brian, did you have anything? Everything I'm hearing is incredible so far. Um, you kind of touched on it a little bit. Uh, a quick question would be, when you guys look for all these expansions and you're adding these coasters, obviously the footprint is very large. Does it come down to where you'd like to put it or where you can put it? You know, so the park being so mature and uh, you don't necessarily get a, an opportunity to just unseat everything that's been done and just start over. So I think creativity comes out of constraint, actually. So you only have so many places in the park where it's going to logically fit. And this is a good example of that. So we wanted to open up the beach. I wanted to do something really terrific at the park, at the, the corner of the park. So then it was a matter of, you know, how do you load? How do you deliver the experience? How do you get out to the front gate? And how do you come back? And if it were just on a blank sheet of paper, I'm not sure we'd have had the same conclusion. Talking about the, the beach again, one more question that comes to mind is, is it a priority going forward, kind of rediscovering the beach more and more as Cedar Point ages, kind of getting back to the roots? Because obviously with Wicked Twister, um, with the giant wheel over here, those have all kind of brought more people back to the beach. Disaster transport blocked any view of it, now it's all kind of opened up. Do you guys want people to come more for the beach along with the park in the future, or is the focus still mainly going to be on the park with the beach? kind of as a, as a side note for anyone staying at the resort. Yeah, so I think Cedar Point has a really good story because it did start with the beach. And people came out here for recreation because it was much cooler than the mainland of Ohio because you're out here on the lake, you always get a breeze, and then the hotels developed, and live music, etc. you know, was the entertainment. So, you know, I, I would like to get uh, a lot of credit for having such a beautiful place, if you will, from the guests and have them come, enjoy the park, but also just the beautiful scenery of being on the lake and the beach. Plus we have all of the resort hotels here, uh, two of which are lakeside, the cabins and cottages, and it's just, it's a lot of fun. You know, so you park, uh, park your car in the lot, spend two days at the point where you can just walk around and consume it all, and it's just, it's very relaxing. It's such a great, beautiful setting that we have here. We're just so fortunate. And I think you had one more. Uh, so I'm trying, I'm racking my brain. I just, there's, I really appreciate you going into detail because you give us so much more than 
what we expect to hear, and it's great to hear all of that. So that's true. I mean, we just appreciate you being open about what goes into the design yeah. process because we really want to portray not just the ride that you see, but the minds behind it and the amount of work and thought that goes into something like this. Especially, like you mentioned, with all the constraints of a, a developed property like this. So we appreciate that. Yeah. So I mean, the only other thing I'd add is, uh, look, it's Cedar Point, and we know how to build roller coasters, so I'm just so proud of the whole team. You know, everyone has their role, but everyone has an idea that they can throw in at any point, and each one builds on the next, so it's very, it's an iterative process, and uh, it's just really rewarding just to be part of that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rob.